I am so honored to be here. The speakers that will discuss the future of the internet and algorithms later on today are so impressive, as are my new friends, Benjamino, Paolo, and Sergio. And it's um, very exciting for the Pew Research Center and our data to be relevant to this conversation. We describe ourselves as a fact tank, not a think tank. And we do that deliberately because we get our funding from an American foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts. Pew is a family name, not an acronym. It's an oil fortune. It's the Sunoco Company. And when the children inherited the fortune, they created a major charity in the United States. And that charity gives us support to be social scientists, not to be advocates. They do not want us to be cheerleaders for technology and the internet and all of the things that are coming into our lives. They do not want us to take positions on issues like net neutrality or privacy or things like that. We are supposed to generate important, high-quality research so that people like you can use it in the way that you choose to decide how to change the world. So that's a little bit of an explanation of why we do what we do and some of the information that I will be giving to you. One of the big things that we have discovered in our research, particularly looking at how Americans uh, use technology, is that there is an enormous, big social change that is occurring in society. It used to be that the atomic unit of social life was very small and very tight-knit. It was the family. It was the village. It was the artisan economic community of that village, but very close in. Everybody knew everybody else. Everybody was gossiping about everybody else. It was very close. Now we have moved to a world where far-flung, loose, dispersed networks are the basic unit of the way that people get along. We do not live in small villages anymore. We live in a global society. Our networks are not tiny with just the people who live near us. They are spread out throughout our communities, throughout our professional worlds. So many different people in different cultures are in this room, and we are all a community. So networks are much more important now as a way for people to organize their lives and to make decisions, to get social support or economic support when they need it, and to share things with the people that matter to them. Networks are also a lot more important now because they are the anchors, they are the bedrock of trust in the world. So much trust has fallen, has been um, displaced from major institutions. In America, every major institution has lost confidence in the past generation, with one exception. The United States military has seen its reputation rise. But banks, big corporations, the church, the media, every major institution has seen declines in trust. And that trust has transferred to personal networks. People now organize their lives around what their friends tell them and what people in their networks tell them. Networks are much different now than the way they used to be. In that tight-knit world, again, it was a small, small community. But now, networks have different segments. Think about your own networks. You have friends who are in this room, professional friends. You have friends in your community. You have friends at your work. You have friends scattered throughout the region. And so there are different ways now we tap into or we access the people in our network. And there are different layers now of networks. It used to be networks where your close friends and your acquaintances. So just two layers. Now we have different gradations, different tiers of those relationships. And we use those tiers in different ways 
in our lives. We use different people to help us solve different problems or make decisions. Networks now are very important because they are the mediators of information that flows into our lives and that we use to provide information to the wider world. Unlike the, the days of the industrial era where so many people depended on major institutions, especially knowledge institutions, media companies, universities, and places like that. They used to be the mediators of information coming into our life. Now, it is our friends who tell us what's important, what's new, what's interesting, what we should be paying attention to. So there are lots of ways that our networks serve really important social purposes in our lives. And now I will get to the numbers part of the program that Paolo was describing. We have been funded by the Pew Research, by the Pew Trusts since the year 2000 to do our research. And we have seen three digital revolutions occur just in the 15 years that we have been studying our subject. We are the luckiest social scientists in the world because three big things have changed during the time we've been studying them and more revolutions are on the way. So I have some new data, by the way. These are brand new data from a survey in Italy. So I'm making news here by disclosing some Italian numbers here. But these three revolutions, the first one was the internet and broadband revolution. In the United States now, 89% of American adults 97% of American teenagers use the internet. It's twice as many as when we first started studying in the year 2000. And 70% of Americans have broadband connections, high-speed connections at home, which is changes the way they access information and they share information and the basic flows of information into their lives. Only 3% had broadband in the year 2000. In Italy, brand new statistics, more than seven in 10 Italians use the internet that is twice as high as when the Pew Research Center stu studied Italy for the first time in the year 2007. So that's revolution number one, internet broadband. The second revolution is the mobile revolution. 92% of American adults have cell phones uh, that they use, and two-thirds of Americans, 68%, have smartphones. In Italy, more than 90%, I'll tell you the real number, it's 95% of Italians have cell phones, and 60% have smartphones. And when you get this special computer in your pocket that also happens to be a phone, uh, it changes the way that you think about information, that you think about access to your friends, that you are aware that information and data and algorithms are immediately available to you. It is transformative. It really changes human behavior and human attitudes. Internet broadband, first revolution. Mobile, the second revolution. Third revolution is social media, social networking. In the United States, 65% of all adults 74% of internet users are social media users. They use Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or WeChat or things like that. Huge growth. We have never seen a consumer electronic technology spread this rapidly in any culture in history. Revolutions are speeding up in their time frames, and more than 60% of Italian adults are social media users. That, again, is a new number. And as you think about the way people use social media, it's, again, for that network purpose, for sharing information, for describing what you're doing, for, for uh, dis disclosing what is going on around you, and, yes, taking pictures of every meal that you eat and sharing it with your friends. These are uh, some global data about developing countries, emerging countries. It's not for, for everyone, but this story has played out around the world in interesting ways. These are data about internet use around the world, and you can see that there is variance, there, is, there are differences between countries in how, much, how many people use the internet. And the differences often are characterized by income, the wealthier you are, the more you, likely you are to use the internet. 
Education, the more education you have, the more likely you are to use the internet. Your familiarity and comfort with English. If you are in another country, even if you are poor, if you speak English or feel comfortable with it, you're more likely to be a, an internet user. And of course, the final differentiator is age. The younger you are, the more likely you are in every culture in the world to be an internet user. These are uh, data about the mobile revolution. And you can see that in many uh, emerging and developing countries, still it is the cell phone that is the most abundantly used instrument. The, the, the farthest line on the right there is the line of how many people in a culture use uh, cell phones. And it's interesting, you know, these numbers are very high in many cultures. Um, and then the number in the dark green is the smartphone users. So there are lots of cell phone users, not as many uh, smartphone users in lots of, of, of different cultures. And those are the, the, the countries that are a little bit lower uh, on the list. You can see that fewer than half of Pakistanis have cell phones and fewer than 10% have um, smartphones. By the way, these slides will be available here, so you do not have to be taking notes a lot on this if you do not want to. And um, one of the most striking things that we've seen as the internet has advanced around the country, uh, the globe, especially with developing and emerging countries, almost every internet user immediately becomes a social media user. In, in many cases, they join the internet community in order to participate in Facebook, and Twitter and other social media sites because that is the enormous social gain that they get when they embrace the internet. So in many cultures, almost everyone who uses the internet is a social media user, which is not the case in some developed countries. In the United States, only two thirds of internet users are social media users. It's a very attractive thing, and it's easy to do um, on, on many internet-connected devices. So there are numbers about internet users and how many of them are social media users. And here are some of the other countries on that list. We'll probably be talking about that later on uh, as uh, Benjamino and I are discussing these numbers. So now, where, where are we going from here? You will get very smart answers from the next speakers uh, in this conference. But I wanted to tell you about a special survey that we did where we, it was not a representative survey, it was not everybody, it was not every expert. What we talked to more than 2,000 experts about the future of technology, especially looking towards the year 2025. So a decade from now, what will digital life be like? And their broad answer, was that the internet will eventually become like electricity, especially in developed countries. The internet will become less visible, but more important and embedded in people's lives. Think about when you walked into this room today. You did not say to yourself, thank goodness I'm on electricity, right? You didn't even notice because it's so much a part of life and so much expected. You would only care about it if the electricity were not working. Right? Well, eventually, the internet will become so embedded in objects as well as in personal contacts that it will fade to the background even as it becomes more important uh, in people's lives, both for good reasons. There are lots of ways that these experts were hopeful, but there are also ways that they worry about the future and some of the impacts of this spread of the internet. They talked about the spread of the internet of things. These are data from uh, Cisco, which is a self-interested company in the uh, Internet of Things. But Cisco projects that by the year 2020, so just five years from now, there will be 50 billion connected devices and other sensors, many more than the number of connected human beings. And when that world comes, maybe not by 2020, maybe later, but when that world comes, they think that this will be enormously helpful, potentially, for healthcare. It will be helpful for education. It will help us navigate the world in more efficient, more satisfying ways. They will help us become more aware as we wear the internet with Fitbit or other monitoring devices or have apps on our smartphones. 
we will become more aware of who we are, how we um, go around the world, what's going on inside our bodies. So the internet, we will wear the internet, we will walk into internet connected rooms, we will sit in internet connected chairs, we will pass through streets that are internet connected and smart, we will walk through uh, environments that have intelligence built into them because all those sensors are passing along information that those algorithms will process. But people worry, those experts worried about what this means for our privacy, it all, they also worry that the technologists are way, way over-promising. They're much too hopeful about some of the benefits and some of the progress that will be made. And they worry about the complexity of technology uh, in this new environment. So these are, are the last themes that I wanted to go through from this survey. They talked about the spread of the internet in this same way. It will be around the world, it will be spread through devices, it will be built through smart sensors and cameras and software and databases and massive data centers. So there are ways now, again, sort of information is all around us. The French have a wonderful notion that now data is your third skin. Your first skin is your skin, your second skin is your clothes, and this, your third skin will be data. It will be that immediate, that proximate, that ubiquitous for people in their lives. They talked about augmented reality enhancements. So we will be able, and, and artificial intelligence will be built into the world so that as we are navigating spaces, as we are engaged with other people, uh, there will be ways that data and the real world will merge together. Some people call this the metaverse where all of our environments will be rich and thick with, with data, and that might help us get around. They talk about social and business encounters. They talk about uh, virtual reality and avatars and holograms, so that maybe this conference in 10 years won't need to take place in a wonderful new building like this. We will all be having our avatars sit in chairs in virtual rooms, and we will love seeing the avatar of Paulo as he gets up and talks about uh, the, the world uh, to come. But it will change the notion of when we are present and when we are absent, and who we are engaged with and who we are not. And they talked about the environment being mapped in new ways, especially as these algorithms come into being, we will just have a much more vivid, intense sense of what the world around us looks like. But they talked about dark sides as well. They talked about things to be concerned about. Privacy will be more at risk. Uh, when all these data are collected about us, these experts said maybe privacy will vanish to the point where only the rich can purchase their way out of being known, being tracked, being profiled, and things like that. Um, they talked about the increase of digital divides. In this new world, smart people will be able to use these systems to their advantage. They will be able to navigate smartly. They will be able to organize their information streams smartly. They will understand what algorithms are doing to them. They will have a rich, amazing new life. The people who do not understand what's going on, the people who are steered by, uh, by algorithms, are, are funneled by algorithms into certain decisions or certain things, they will be at a disadvantage because they will not necessarily have the capacity to make their own choices. They will not necessarily be able to get information, get access to people uh, that they want. Abuses and abusers will evolve and scale so all of this technology can do wonderful things for people, but bad guys can use them in new ways to make humans miserable and to be destructive uh, in their way. They, the human character, these experts were saying, human character will not change, and so bad actors will use these tools in ways to hurt people. And the, a theme that was so interesting in the discussion last night was that human institutions will not be able to keep up with technology. If you look at technology change over the centuries, usually, especially in the Industrial Revolution, we only had, we had time 
to change our ways. We had time to adapt our institutions and our rules and our norms to new ways. Now the pace of change, the speed of change in all of these fronts is coming so fast it's not just digital technology, it's biotechnology, it's genomics, it's all kinds of algorithms. The human institutions, their capacity to process all this change and to make sure that the rules that are written are human rules, are rules that honor morality, honor human choice and agency. There are lots of ways that these experts worry. And I guess I will cite a, a final theme that I did not put in my slides. There's great concern about the social and political disruptions that will occur as so many jobs are fundamentally changed in this new world. There are all sorts of estimates about how many jobs will be displaced and what kind of new jobs will come in. But people are really worried about um, what this means for people who don't necessarily have high levels of education, who have middle levels of skills and capacities. So there's a, that will be a, a big part, I think, of the conversation that comes later on. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your attention. <laughs>